I want to show you my vacation photos. I think that those words have been proven to induce boredom more quickly than any other words in the English language. Nevertheless, I want to show you some vacation photos, although not mine. In 1938, my grandparents, David and Lisa Kurtz, traveled from New York to Europe for a six-week summer vacation. They'd both been born in Europe, in Poland, in the 1880s, and come to the United States in the 1890s as young children with their families. They'd made good in America, and they were now celebrating their newfound prosperity by taking a grand tour of the cultural capitals on the continent. They went to Paris, they went to Brussels, they went to Amsterdam, they viewed the Swiss Alps. They went to the south of France, and they ended the trip in England, where they boarded the Queen Mary to return home. My grandfather, being like tourists everywhere, wanted to document this trip for the folks back home, and so he carried with him the latest in technology, a home movie camera, the iPhone of its day. There's nothing particularly important about that. There were thousands and thousands of people who traveled to Europe that summer, and most of them carried some form of documentation for their trip. A still camera, of course, was much more uh, common, but a movie camera wasn't uncommon. The Kodak company had been marketing home movie cameras since the early 1930s. In 1935, they introduced Kodachrome color film for home movie cameras. And in 1936, they'd introduced what was an Instamatic home movie camera, which is the kind that my grandfather had. The film was contained in a cartridge. You put it in the camera, you wound up that motor, you pressed the shutter, and it worked. Their slogan was one, two, three, it's loaded. Again, there's nothing particularly special about that. Tourists travel to foreign places. Tourists take pictures of themselves while they're there. Tourists come back home and bore their friends and family with the photos of their trip. You've probably even done it yourself. But this is when the story gets a little bit more interesting. In between Brussels and the Swiss Alps, my grandparents took a detour to the town of Nashelsk, Poland, where my grandfather was born, just 35 miles northwest of Warsaw. At the time of their visit, Nashelsk had about 4,500 people, of whom 3,000 were Jews. The Jews had been living in Nashelsk for hundreds of years, they were mostly poor, tradesmen, and merchants. And they lived a relatively traditional life. The appearance of an American, in particular an American with a home movie camera, was a major event in the life of the town. Everyone turned out to see them, in particular the children. You can roll the video. This is a brief clip of the film. One year after this film was taken, on September 1st, 1939, the German army invaded Poland, beginning World War II. Nashelsk, just 50 miles south of the German border, was occupied on September 4th, 1939, and the harassment and persecution of the Jewish population began immediately. Jewish women were raped. Jewish stores were looted. Religious men with beards had them cut off with bayonets. The entire population was subject to random seizure for forced labor. The cemetery was desecrated. The synagogue was desecrated. And on December 3, 1939, just three months after the German invasion, the entire Jewish population of Nashelsk was deported. They were loaded onto boxcars without food, without water. For a week, they were shunted from station to station until finally they were dropped off in a town in central Poland that would eventually become one of the major transit ghettos on the train route to Treblinka. In August 1942, the vast majority of the Jewish population of Nashelsk was murdered in the gas chambers. <laughs> 
of the 3,000 Jews who were there in 1938 when my grandparents visited, fewer than 100 survived. My grandfather's film hadn't changed at all. What changed is the world around it. Suddenly, this tourist film became enormously significant. It was suddenly these three minutes of film were the only record of the life of the Jews of Nashelsk prior to their utter destruction in the Holocaust. My grandparents never realized what they had. And my parents never realized the significance of the film. It sat first in my grandparents' apartment, then in the closet in my parents' house for 70 years. When I found the film in 2009, I donated it to the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. And they undertook to preserve this artifact. But what does it mean to preserve an artifact? The question that intrigued me then and still motivates me today is really a very simple one, and yet if pursued with, with intensity and rigor, in some sense, it's an endless one. The question, what are we looking at? What is preserved when we preserve this film? Of course, on one hand, it remains tourist footage, my grandparents' summer vacation. In the context of the Holocaust Museum's collection, it takes on a different significance. It becomes evidence of pre-war Jewish life in Poland, of interest to scholars and historians. It becomes symbolic, representative of the many, many small towns like Nashelsk that suffered a similar fate. But what was most compelling to me, though, was not the personal context or this larger historical context, but something in the middle. The film shows particular people on a particular day in a particular town. And I wondered how much of that particularity could be recovered 75 years after the fact after so much violence had been visited on this community. In December 2011, two years after I began my search, I received an email from a woman in Detroit whom I didn't know. She said that a friend had pointed out this film to her, had brought it to her attention, and as she watched it and the camera panned across the crowd and all the children jumped up, to get their faces in my grandfather's camera, she recognized her grandfather as a 13-year-old boy. And her grandfather was still alive. This man, Maurice Chandler, was the sole survivor of his family. And in more than a year now of talking with him and talking about the town of Nashelsk, the town of his childhood, we've been able to identify about a dozen people in my grandfather's film. These identifications have led us to other survivors and to the families of some of the people who did not survive. I want to share with you just one strand of the research that we've undertaken. One of the people Mr. Chandler identified here on the left and the lower right, the man with the beard, he remembered the name Kubel. Among the many archives and other sources that I consulted, I looked in the archives of the Jewish Genealogical Society. This is an online forum for people researching their family history. I found an email from 1996 from a woman searching for the family Kubel from the town of Nashalsk. Fifteen years after she wrote that email, I was able to reach her. And she sent me this photograph here on the right. The man on the upper left, standing with the beard, is the same man in my grandfather's film. The woman on the right, in the snazzy plaid suit, Sura Kubel, was this woman's mother, the woman I'd come into contact with, her mother. She was the only survivor of her family. Like many survivors, she didn't talk much about the family that had been lost in the war. And so the daughter knew very little about her aunts and her uncles. But the Kubel family lived next door to Mr. Chandler's family in the Shulk. 
And so he was able to provide information about the lost relatives that this woman's mother had never given her. There was another photograph in the Kubel family archive. It meant nothing whatsoever to the daughter of Sura Kubel. But when I showed it to Mr. Chandler, he was amazed. First, because he himself is sitting here in the center. But that was not the most amazing thing to him. He immediately recognized that this photograph was taken in the workshop behind his family's store. And the thing that was most meaningful to him was that this boy here on the lower right is his younger brother, and the man above him, his father. These are the only photographs, this is the only photograph of his father and his brother that have survived. I researched the Kubel family, and I learned that Sura Kubel, the mother of the woman I was in touch with, had come to the United States in November 1938. And I found the ship's manifest that documented her arrival in New York. On this document, it states that her passage had been paid for and her emigration sponsored by a man named Louis Molina. Louis Molina was my grandfather's best friend, and he and his wife had accompanied my grandparents on their trip to Europe in 1938. Each of these pieces, when brought into context with the others, lends significance and meaning. And it's through this context that the life of the town becomes somewhat more visible to us. In the end, I've been able to identify perhaps three or four percent of the information that's in this film. Three or four percent is an extraordinary amount, considering the amount of time that's passed and the violence under which the town was destroyed. But this means that 95% of that information contained in the film, just like 95 or 97% of the town that was destroyed, is lost and cannot be recovered. Now, whether this happens because of violence or whether it's simply the result of time, this is the fate of all the information that we collect the information that holds together what we understand as our world. Most of it disappears. What little of it remains becomes vague and loses definition. It becomes symbolic over time because there's no one left who can speak about it with specificity. No one who can recall the links that held these disparate pieces together. So think about now the photos on your cell phone or the vacation pictures that you've posted to your Facebook page. We may think of today as being the most thoroughly document, documented moment in human history. And for the moment, that may be true. But digital data is much more perishable than the 16 millimeter film stock my grandfather used in 1938. That film lasted for more than 70 years and could still be played and viewed. The data on your flash drive, on your CDs, DVDs, on your hard drive, on your floppy disks. In 20 years, if there are even software and hardware devices left to read it, that data will most likely be gone. Now, probably most of that data is just trivial. Pictures of your vacation, for example. It won't be a terrible loss to history if it goes away. But that's the problem. We don't know what is historically important, and most likely we'll never know in our lifetimes. There's no intrinsic difference between junk and information. No inherent difference between travel film and historical film. The difference is created by time, by timing, by context, and by the stories we're able to tell to link together the pieces that remain. 75 years from now, this moment will be just as difficult, if not more so, to recreate as the town of Nashelsk in 1938. And it may be that our very existence, the records of our very existence, will come down 
to just three minutes of video preserved by chance. Thank you.